This lecture is part of an online undergraduate course on the theory of numbers. This is just the introductory lecture, so what I'll be doing is giving an informal survey of some of the problems that occur in the theory of numbers. So the theory of numbers is mostly about positive integers and in particular about primes. So you all know the primes 2, 3, 5, 7, 11 and so on. And we can ask some basic questions about primes. For instance, you might ask how many are there? And the answer to this was given by Euclid more than 2,000 years ago. He said that there are infinitely many. Well, actually, he didn't say that there are infinitely many because Euclid kind of didn't really approve of the concept of infinity. And what he said was that for any finite number of primes, you can find another one. But that's the same, really the same as saying there are infinitely many. We can ask a more precise question. How many are there less than or equal to x? for some real number x? Well, it's quite difficult to give an exact answer to this because, as you see from the list of primes, they look a bit random. But we can ask um, roughly how many are there less than x? And there's the answer to this is there are roughly x over log of x. I should say I'm using the mathematician's notation where logarithm means natural logarithms to base e. Um, and people quite often use ln as an, uh, in, instead if they're not mathematicians, but this is the traditional notation. Um, this is called the prime number theorem. And this was possibly the one of the biggest results proved from the 19th century. It was proved by Adamar and de la Vallée Poussin. Um, and what it says is, roughly speaking, the chance that some large number n is prime is about 1 over log of n. Well, of course, that's a sort of meaningless question, that, that a large number doesn't have a probability of being prime. It's either prime or it isn't. So um, um, in number theory, you sort of quite often use improbability in a sort of informal way. When you say the chance that a large number n is prime is so and so, what you mean is that if you look at all the numbers from 1 to x for a large x, then the chance of one of those picked at random is about 1 over log of x, which is slightly more meaningful. And there are also some special sorts of primes. So two very famous examples are Mersenne primes which are primes of the form 2 to the n minus 1. For example, um, 3 or 7 or uh, 31 are all 1 less than a power of 2. And you can ask how many of these are there? So are there an infinite number of these? And this is an unsolved problem. Um, number theory uh, is full of questions that you know any almost anyone can ask and that seem almost impossibly difficult to answer. So um, computer calculations of Mersenne primes sort of hint that there may be infinitely many. I mean, we found quite a lot of them. Um, incidentally, um, the largest known prime at any given time is almost always a Mersenne prime. That's because it happens to be particularly easy to check whether or not a Mersenne number is a prime or not. Um, Alternatively, you can ask, are there about Fermat primes? Sure. So um, here we take 2 to the n minus 1. Fermat primes are of the form 2 to the n plus 1, except it's easy to check that the exponent usually has to be itself a power of 2. So Fermat primes are usually taken to be primes of this form. And here there are some examples, 3, 5, 17, 257, 65537, and these are the only ones known. Um, people have done computer searches up to quite high uh, values of n, and so far none of them have turned up. So it is an open question, are there any more Fermat primes? Um, Fermat primes also turn up in a rather odd way. So, so there's the very ancient geometric question of which regular polygons you can construct by ruler and compass. And 
Gauss absolutely stunned everybody in the around 1800 by showing that you can construct a regular polygon with a prime number of sides if and only if the prime was two or one of these one of these Fermat primes. So there's a very unexpected connection with geometry there. Um, primes also turn up in the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, um, which we will be proving a bit later. Um, I just recall that this says every number Every positive integer can be written as a product of primes in a unique way, up to order, of course. For instance, we can write 120 as 2 times 2 times 2 times 3 times 5, and there's no other way of writing 120 as a product of primes except by reordering them. So the next uh, common thing you try and do in the theory of numbers is try and solve Diophantine equations. So what are these? Well, they're named after this guy called Diophantus. And not a lot is known about Diophantus. He seemed to have worked in something like the third century and may have been in Alexandria, but we don't really know much else about him. Um, so a Diophantine equation is an equation where you want the solutions to be integers. Actually, Diophantus himself um, didn't seem to have looked at solutions that were integers. First of all, he insisted that his solutions were, had to be positive because at that time negative numbers weren't really counted as numbers. Um, secondly, he was quite happy with rational numbers as solutions and not just integers. Anyway, Diophantine equation normally means you want the solutions to be integers. So here are some examples. First of all, we can have linear equations. So we might want to solve 27x plus 11y equals 1. And um, we'll be studying Euclid's algorithm for solving this. Linear equations, you know, it's not immediately obvious what x and y are, but it's not terribly difficult to find them. Then we can look at quadratic ones. And here there's a very famous one. We can have a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So this is the Pythagoras um, showed that if you've got a, b and c like that, they form a right angle triangle. For instance, the famous example is 3 squared plus 4 squared equals 5 squared. So there's a problem. Can we classify all solutions of this equation? More generally, you can look at binary quadratic forms. So a binary quadratic form is something of the form ax squared plus bxy plus cy squared, where a, b and c are constants. For instance, we could have x squared plus y squared as a binary quadratic form. And we can ask, you know, which integers does it represent? That means when can we solve this equation here? Um, and this can be quite difficult. For example, if we look at the equation x squared equals 94y squared plus 1, well, it has an obvious solution where y is 0, but What's the next solution? Well, you can find a solution x equals 2, 1, 4, 3, 2, 9, 5, and y equals 2, 2, 1, 0, 6, 4. So we want to discuss how do you find such huge solutions? Well, these days there's a kind of stupid way to find these solutions because any computer will find these solutions in a blink of an eye. But what we really want to do is have an efficient algorithm for finding these solutions but that doesn't involve just checking every number until you hit a solution. So we would like to understand this well enough that we can find solutions like this by hand without checking every possible case and not just using a very big computer. So roughly speaking, degree two Diophantine equations are pretty well understood. That they're, they're not at all trivial, but we can generally answer questions about them, if, at least if we've got only one. Degree three, on the other hand, equations tend to be really hard. There's a really notorious example called Fermat's Last Theorem, which um, wasn't a theorem by Fermat and wasn't his last one either, but um, anyway. Um, so it rather famously said, can you have any solutions of the equation x to the n plus y to the n equals z to the n with n greater than or equal to 3? 
Um, by solutions, you mean non-trivial solutions, so x, y, and z aren't allowed to be zero, or otherwise it's kind of trivial. And Fermat himself proved this was impossible for n equals 3 or 4, and claimed to have done it for other exponents, but probably didn't. Anyway, this was finally proved by Wiles, and this was a great relief to everybody when he did it, because Fermat's last theorem, um, every mathematical amateur in the world tried to prove Fermat's last theorem. They always sent their solutions to math departments, and mathematicians had to think of polite ways of telling them that their solutions were wrong. Um, so another famous example is the Diophantine equation x cubed plus y cubed equals z cubed plus w cubed. And this equation has a sort of little story behind it, because the, when the great mathematician Ramanujan was in hospital, he was visited by Hardy, who apparently said he came in taxi cab number 1729 and said what a boring number it was. And Ramanujan said, no, it wasn't boring. It was the indicated the smallest solution of this equation because 1 cubed plus 12 cubed is equal to 10 cubed plus 9 cubed. Actually, I sort of suspect Hardy knew perfectly well this was an interesting number. I'm just trying to cheer a manager not by giving him something to think about, but whatever. Um, by the way, when I say degree th at least 3 is hard, this is actually a, a theorem. Um, there's a very famous theorem by, by Julia Robinson, Martin Davis, and Putnam, and Matiasevich that says there is no algorithm that will tell you whether any given Diophantine equation has a solution or not. I mean, for a, for a fixed Diophantine equation, you may be able to solve it, but there is no algorithm that will work for all Diophantine equations. Um, so the best we can do is, is find methods for solving special classes of Diophantine equations. We're never going to come to an end of open problems about them. Um, so how do you solve Diophantine equations? Well, one very powerful technique is congruences. So suppose we want to solve the equation x squared equals 1, 2, 9, 8, 7, 3, 2, 4, 8, 6, 5, 9, 7. OK, well, you could sit down with a pocket calculator or something and think about it. But in fact, there's a very quick solution. You just look at this last digit and notice that it's a 7. And we notice the last digit of x squared is always 0, 1, 4, 5, 6, or 9. And so we can see instantly that this number can't be a square just by looking at its last digit. This is an example of looking at a congruence. So, so we recall that we say A is congruent to B modulo M. Um, this just means the difference A minus B is divisible by M. So roughly speaking, modulo M means um, you sort of ignore multiples of this number m. For example, when we say the last digit of x squared is 0, 1, 4, 5, 6, or 9, well, the last digit means you're looking at mod 10. So this just says x squared is congruent to 0, 1, 4, 5, 6, or 9, modulo 10. Um, and working modulo a number is a very powerful technique. And in fact, the working modulo a given number turns out to form something called a ring that we will review. It basically says the usual rules of high school arithmetic mostly sort of work, with one or two exceptions, when you're just working modulo a number. In particular, if we've got a polynomial equation, suppose we've got some Diophantine equation, which has a may or may not have a solution x, y, z equals naught. You can ask, does this have a solution in z? Well, if it has a solution in z, this implies that p, x, y, z is congruent to naught mod m has a solution for all integers m. So you can quite often show that this Diophantine equation doesn't have a solution by showing that it doesn't have a solution modulo, say, 73 or something. Then you can ask, does the converse hold? So suppose you can solve an equation modulo m for all um, integers m, and maybe also solve it over the real numbers. Can you solve it over the integers? Well, if you can, you say the Hasse principle 
holds. Um, it's called the Hasse principle because Hasse proved that something like this quite often holds for quadratic equations. Um, this is not trivial even for quadratic equations. For example, suppose you're given a number a. Um, suppose you can solve x squared is congruent to a mod m for all m. Then we can ask, is a a square? And you see this, it's not terribly difficult to answer, but it's not quite trivial either. Um, it turns out, so, so anyway, the Hasse principle holds for linear equations and sort of holds for quadratic equations sometimes. Um, whether or not it holds for equations of high degree is a rather tricky question. In fact, it usually doesn't. And then you have to sort of try and figure out what the obstruction to it holding is. Um, one very famous question about congruence, as I should mention, is Fermat's theorem, which has nothing to do with Fermat's last theorem. So Fermat's theorem just says that x to the p is congruent to x mod p when p is prime. And this is an absolutely fundamental theorem of number theory. I mean, almost... I mean, a huge amount of number theory would just disappear if you weren't allowed to use this. For example, it says 2 to the 11 is congruent to 2 modulo 11, which you can check. That's 2048 minus 2, which is 2046, which is divisible by 11. Um, so let me just mention one application of this theorem. It gives us a usual test for primes. So if you've got a large number n, it can be quite difficult to tell whether or not it's prime. And one way that sometimes works is, suppose you've got this number n, you look at 2 to the n modulo n, and if 2 to the n is not congruent to 2 modulo n, this implies n is not prime. And as we will see, it turns out to be quite easy to check um, whether or not 2 to the n is 2 modulo n, even if n is very big and has hundreds of digits. So this sometimes allows you to show that numbers are not prime. Um, the converse isn't true, that sometimes n is not prime, but 2 to the n can still be congruent to 2 modulo n. So it's actually quite a tricky question um, to think what other conditions you need to show that n is prime. Um, finding large primes is actually really useful in cryptography because many of the um, methods of encryption used these days on the internet for you know even buying and selling things and so on um, depend on the existence of large primes um, so I mean I think you know, the, the, the number theorist Hardy used to like to sort of boast that the number theory he did was completely and utterly useless and it turns out that it isn't. I mean um, cryptography is now worth billions and billions of dollars because it underlies most internet sales so even the most apparently useless bits of mathematics quite often turn out to be quite useful. Um, so um, um, next we um, look, look at a special case of congruences which are called quadratic residues. So um, one of the most fundamental questions about a number a turns out to be whether a is a square modulo m and for various historic reasons um, we say a is a quadratic residue mod m if x squared is congruent to a mod m is solvable. In other words, you could find an x such that a is a square. You could just say a is a square modulo m, and this would be clearer, but for historical reasons, they're called quadratic residues. Um, sometimes we insist that a should not be divisible by m or should be co-prime to m. So this really just means a is a square modulo m. For example, if m is equal to 5, let's find the quadratic residues. Well, 1 and 4 are obviously quadratic residues because they're the squares of 1 and 2. And 
If you add a multiple of 5 to these, that will still be a quadratic residue. So we get 6, 9, 11, 14, and so on. And quadratic non-residues are 2, 3, 7, 8, 13, uh, and 12, and so on. Um, whether or not 0 or 5 or 10 and so on count as quadratic residues depends on which definition of quadratic residue you use. It's a little bit unclear. So um, um, quadratic residues leads to the notion of quadratic reciprocity. I really wish they'd found a word that was easier to spell. Um, so quadratic reciprocity is the following. Let's look at the following two questions. Is P a square modulo Q? So here I'm going to take P and Q to be odd primes and ask whether this is solved. But I'm also going to ask whether X squared is congruent to Q mod P is solvable. So we've got two different equations. And these seem to have nothing to do with each other. So the first one says you can solve x squared equals p plus mq. And the second one says you can solve x squared equals q plus um, mp for some p. And, you know, there's, there's no reason, no obvious reason why these two equations should have anything very much to do with each other. Well, it turns out that, that, that whether or not you can solve the first equation is very closely connected with whether or not you can solve the second equation. If P um, or Q is congruent to 1 modulo 4, then we can either solve both or neither. On the other hand, if P and q are both congruent to 3 mod 4, we can solve exactly 1, um, which is a, I don't know, a very bizarre result. Um, there's this very mysterious hidden relation between these two equations. And in fact, that is in some sense the essence of what mathematics is about. It's about finding unexpected hidden structure. Here we found this unexpected hidden connection between these two equations. So to show that this is powerful and non-trivial, and we notice that 101 is a square modulo 5. And this is obvious because this is congruent to 1 modulo 5. Now these are both primes that are congruent to 1 mod 4. So this implies that 5 is a square modulo 101. And I think this is by no means obvious. What it says is you can solve x squared equals 5 plus 101 times m. And you can try and find the smallest value of x. And if you use trial and error, it'll probably take you quite a long time to find it um, if you're doing it by hand. Um, so um, next I'll give some examples of a few other areas of mathematics. First of all, we have additive number theory. And this is a question of asking which numbers you can get by adding numbers from a certain set. Quite often you ask about adding or subtracting primes. So one of the most famous and notorious of these is Goldbach's conjecture. He asked, is every even number greater than or equal to 4, the sum of two primes. Um, and this just seems to be out of reach of present techniques. This is another example of the question, you know, any someone who knows almost nothing about number theory or mathematics could ask this question. It just baffles everybody. Um, we've got some partial results on easier questions. So Hardy and Littlewood and Vinogradov showed that every odd number that's sufficiently large is the sum of three primes. And this is a bit weaker because if, if every even number is a sum of two, then you can very easily get every odd number bigger than seven or something as a sum of three primes. Um, so Hardy and Littlewood gave a, 
conditional proof on this where they assumed a rather difficult unproved hypothesis and Vinogradov then managed to remove this assumption. Um, there's another variation on Goldbach's conjecture. Chen in about the 1970s showed that um, you can write almost every even number as the sum of a prime plus a product of two primes. So he's sort of using three primes rather than two primes to get it. And apparently this made Chen really famous in China. I mean, it, his result got into newspaper headlines and so on. And for, for some time, um, although most of the um, amateurs sending in proofs were trying to prove Fermat's last theorem, if, if the proof came from China, it was always an attempted proof of Goldbach's conjecture because Chen had become so famous in China. Another variation of this is, are there an infinite number of prime pairs or twin primes. So what are these? Well these are primes that differ by two. For instance we can have 3 and 5 or 11 and 13 or 29 and 31 and it sure seems that there are a lot of them but again this seems to be completely out of reach of current techniques. Um, there was some amazing progress on this recently by Zhang um, or I hope I pronounce his name right, who showed that um, there are infinitely many pairs of primes that differ by at most 70 million. So all we've got to do is to get 70 million down to two and we've proved it. And you may think 70 million isn't very impressive, but it's far better than anything anybody else had managed to prove. Um, this number 70 million has since been reduced. I think the current record is a few hundred or so, but um, um, the, the really big step was getting it from very little known to 70 million. Once you've got it down to some finite number, you can just sort of nibble away at it and get it down earlier. So th th this is an example of subtracting primes rather than adding them, but it's still an additive operation. Um, and it's also a question about gaps between primes. And questions about gaps between primes seem to be incredibly difficult. For instance, there's a notorious old question. Is there a prime between n squared and n plus 1 squared. So that's saying are gaps between primes at most about the square root of n in some sense. And they seem in practice to be much smaller than that, that the biggest gap between primes seems to be at most log of n squared or something like that. But nobody has managed to get anywhere close to proving even this much weaker bound. Um, incidentally, there's a view, or at least there used to be a view, that, that adding or subtracting primes was a kind of silly thing to do. Um, for example, the, um, the, the very great applied mathematician Vladimir Arnold once wrote a report on the Zurich Mathematical Congress, and in that he poured absolute scorn on these sort of questions. He, he, he quoted the physicist Landau, who's nothing to do with the number theorist Landau, who said, you know, why are these idiotic mathematicians adding primes? Primes are meant to be multiplied, not added. So Arnold in particular had complete contempt for this sort of um, problem. However, I should say that Arnold had complete contempt for the whole of number theory as far as I can figure out, or, or maybe he was just enjoyed being provocative, I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I think I should say I think part of the reason why people dismiss these questions is they were simply too difficult. I mean there's, there's a certain amount of sour grapes going on that if a question is just too difficult there's a temptation to say it's just a silly question we shouldn't be looking at it. But um, the, the fact that we've had you know quite substantial progress um, by Zhang and Chen in the last few decades suggests that maybe these questions are, should be taken more seriously. Now we come to some questions that really almost certainly are nonsense. Let's talk a bit about recreational um, number theory and give some examples of these. Well, these are questions that just don't seem to have any interesting structure behind them that anyone has ever managed to find out. So let me give some examples. Um, you can talk about perfect numbers. So these are numbers that are the sum of their proper divisors. So 6 is 1 plus 2 plus 3, and 1 and 2 and 3 are the divisors of 6 other than 6 itself. And 28 is 
1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 7 plus 14. So 6 and 28 are both perfect numbers. And a couple of thousand years ago, you know, perfect numbers were almost the centre of number theory and quite a few people seem to take them very seriously. Um, Euclid, for example, has um, a proposition about them showing that if 2 to the p minus 1 is prime, which you'll recognise as being a Mersenne prime, then 2 to the p minus 1 times 2 to the p minus 1 is perfect. And notice that here the 1 is in the exponent and there, there, there it's down there. So, so this is 2 to the 2 minus 1 times 2 to the 2 minus 1 and this is 2 to the um, 3 minus 1 times 2 to the 3 minus 1 for example. So there you get the first 2. Um, and you can see examples of things called deficient numbers such as 4 where the sum of the divisors is less than the number and abundant numbers where the sum of the divisors is greater than the number. So here 12 is abundant. So that's greater than 12 and this is less than 4. And some people used to take these quite seriously. I mean there, there was a guy called Nicomachus who wrote, a, um, who wrote all about these and said you know deficient numbers are horrible because they're like an animal with limbs missing and abundant numbers are like monstrosities with extra limbs but perfect numbers are just right and frankly nobody has any idea what he was talking about. Um, perfect numbers also turn up in um, religious works of all places. So St Augustine wrote a famous book called The City of God which is apparently a foundational work in Catholic theology and in the middle of this several hundred page book um, he starts defining perfect numbers and he explains, you know, he gives a correct definition of perfect number and explains that the reason God created the world in six days is that six is a perfect number and I have no idea why a reasonably intelligent person would come up with such a bizarre idea and I don't think anybody else understands it either. Um, and we can also have various other variations, for instance we can talk about amicable numbers. These are numbers such that 200, like 220 and 284 where 220 is the sum of the proper divisors of 284 and 284 is the sum of the proper divisors of 220. So what seems to be going on here is people are considering this dynamical system where you take a number n and you map it to the sum of the proper divisors. And then you can say perfect numbers are the fixed points of this dynamical system and amicable numbers are orbits of size 2 and people also look at orbits of higher size. So you could say that you know, the study of perfect numbers is really a special case of the study of discrete dynamical systems which is actually a reasonably serious topic. Um, here's another famous example. Suppose you take a number n and then you map it to n over 2 if n is even and 3n plus 1 if n is odd. Um, so this is sometimes called the 3n plus 1 problem and you keep repeating this. And the problem is if you start with a number n do you always eventually get to 1? So this is another dynamical system. You're taking a number n and iterating this operation a lot of times and it's very hard to tell what happens. Um, in fact in general you can't really tell what happens with a discrete dynamical system because um, any Turing machine can be encoded as a discrete dynamical system and you, uh, there's in general no way to tell what a Turing machine does. So all these sorts of questions are in general um, incredibly difficult to solve. Um, so now let's give a brief survey of analytic number theory. Here we have one of the most famous or notorious functions in mathematics, the Riemann zeta function, which is 1 over 1 to the s plus 1 over 2 to the s plus 1 over 3 to the s and so on. Um, for instance, Euler became very famous by showing, by working out zeta of s when zeta is equal to 2, he showed that zeta of 2 is pi squared over 6 and he went on to show that zeta of 4 is equal to pi to the 4 over 90. 
Uh, so what zeta of three, nobody knows. There's, the, the, there's no similar result for zeta of three that anyone has ever found out. It's known to be irrational. This was a stunning result proved by Apare uh, a few decades ago, but um, no one's ever found a really nice explicit formula for it. So Euler also found this really nice infinite product for zeta of s. It's 1 over 1 minus 2 to the s times 1 over 1 minus 3 to the minus s times 1 over 1 minus 5 to the minus s times 1 over 1 minus 7 to the minus s and so on. And you notice all the primes are turning up here. Um, and this strongly suggests that this function zeta of s has something to do with primes. And in fact, it seems to sort of control primes. For instance, Riemann found this amazing formula. I'll tell you what it's a formula for in a moment. So his formula is the logarithmic integral of x minus the sum over rho of the logarithmic integral of x to the rho. So what's going on here? Well, li of x is more or less the logarithmic integral Well, it's not quite equal to this. There are some minor technical complications that I won't go into. Here, these numbers rho are over the zeros of the zeta function of s. And these are actually complex zeros. And this is a little bit odd because zeta of s only occurs, only converges when the real part of s is at least 1. And these zeros all of real part less than one. So you need to do something rather clever to make sense of zeta of s for other complex values of s. And this is done by something called analytic continuation, which occurs in complex analysis courses. So anyway, Riemann found this amazing formula, but I haven't told you what it's a formula for. Well, it's almost a formula for the number of primes less than x. except it's not quite because we have to count p to the n as 1 over n of a prime. So it's really a formula for a weighted sum of prime powers where prime powers like 4 and 8 are sort of almost primes. And Riemann's formula is rather extraordinary. For instance, if you ignore all these terms here and only look at the first term and work out the number of primes less than, say, 10 to the 8, you find the number of primes is 5761455, whereas Riemann's formula gives 5761522 as its first term, and these various correction terms give you the difference. So you can see um, the difference is only about a hundred out of you know sort of five million primes. So, so, so Riemann found this astonishingly accurate formula for primes. In fact, it, it's exact if you include the correction terms, but the Correction terms are kind of tricky because they depend on the zeros of the zeta function. And it's a really hard problem trying to figure out where these are. Riemann came up with this conjecture called the Riemann hypothesis that they all have real part at most a half. Um, and they certainly seem to, but this is, you know, this Riemann hypothesis is possibly the most notorious current open problem in mathematics. Um, Next, we move on to a bit more analytic number theory. We go to Dirichlet's theorem. Um, Dirichlet proved there are infinitely many primes with last digit 3. And this seems kind of obvious. The last digit of a prime other than 2 and 5 must be 1, 3, 7 and 9. And it seems reasonably plausible that there should be infinitely many with each of these last digits, but it's surprisingly difficult to prove. More generally, he proved there are infinitely many primes of the form a n plus b, where a and b are co-prime, and uh, n is an integer greater than or equal to zero. So this is an arithmetic progression, and he showed that for every arithmetic progression there are infinitely many primes in it, unless there obviously aren't, because if a and b have a common factor, then, the, then you obviously can't do that. Um, and Dirichlet proved this by using generalizations of the Riemann zeta function, which are now called Dirichlet L series in his honor. So a typical one is 1 over 1 to the s minus 1 over 3 to the s plus 1 over 5 to the s, minus 1 over 7 to the s, and so on. 
Um, and the amazing thing about Dirichlet's theorem was he was proving theorems about primes, which are just integers, by making use of analysis. His, his proof made essential use of the fact this is a function of a real variable s. So that's a good example of analytic number theory, where you use analysis to prove results about number theory. Um, by the way, Dirichlet's theorem sounds... Um, um, a bit like a theorem due to Green and Tau. So the Green-Tau theorem says we can find long arithmetic progressions of primes. So for example we can find an arithmetic progression of length 3 which is 3, 5, 7 or we can find the arithmetic regression 5, um, 11, 17, 23, 29 of length 5. And you may ask, can you find an infinitely long arithmetic progression of primes? And it's an easy exercise to show that you can't. Then you can ask, can you find arithmetic progressions that are as long as you like? And Green and Tau managed to show that you can. Um, and the proof is kind of amazing since people have thought this sort of question was just out of reach. Um, it's another of these questions about adding or subtracting primes, which are always very difficult. Um, in fact, I think Tau has said that this is not really a, question, a theorem about primes at all. It's really a theorem about arithmetic progressions. What it says is you can find arithmetic progressions in... There's a sort of principle you can find long arithmetic progressions in any set of numbers that's reasonably dense. And what you have to do is to show that in some sense primes are dense enough for this to work. Um, incidentally, you... Um, um, the, 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 the green tau theorem sounds as if it doesn't have any applications, but in fact there was an odd application of it. Um, I said the um, um, Robinson and Davis and Putnam and Matiasevich proved that you can't um, find an algorithm for solving Diophantine equations, and earlier Davis and Putnam had proved that for exponential Diophantine equations, but their proof wasn't quite complete because it used this theorem which hadn't actually been proved at the time. So even a rather odd theorem like this does have applications. Um, next I'll give a quick summary of some results in algebraic number theory. So we might ask the following two questions. Can you write a prime p as a sum of two squares? Can you write a square m as a sum of two primes? And at first sight these questions kind of seem equally silly. There's no particular reason for adding primes and doesn't seem to be any particular reason for adding squares. Um, but the first question turns out to have a very beautiful answer. We can write p as a sum of two squares if and only if p is equal to 2 or p is congruent to 1 modulo 4. And one way of solving this is to use the so-called Gaussian integers. So these are, inter th these are numbers of the form m plus ni, where i is the complex number with square minus 1, and m and n are just ordinary integers. And the Gaussian integers behave quite like the ordinary integers in many ways. For instance, um, there's a theorem about unique factorization into primes, and the factorization of primes is a little bit different than the Gaussian integers. For instance, you might think that 5 is prime, but in the Gaussian integers it's 2 plus i times 2 minus i. And similarly, 13 is 3 plus 2i times 3 minus 2i. And if you multiply these out, you find this is 2 squared plus 1 squared, and this is 3 squared plus 2 squared. So the fact that 5 and 13 factorize in the Gaussian integers, it turns out to be related to the fact that they can be written as a sum of two squares. And similarly, 3 can't be written as a product of two smaller numbers, so 3 is not equal to m squared plus n squared for any m and n. So um, it turns out you can 
Prove this theorem of Fermat's that a prime is 1 mod 4 if and only if it's the sum of two squares by making use of the Gaussian integers. Um, if you want to try proving this, it's quite easy to show that if p is 3 mod 4, then it's not a sum of two squares. But it's much harder to show that if p is 1 mod 4, then it is a sum of two squares. Anyway, this is one of the things we'll be doing later. Um, then I'll give some examples from combinatorial number theory. So um, one example is the partition function. So suppose we've got a number 5 and we try and write it as a sum of positive integers. Well, we can write it as 5 or 4 plus 1 or 3 plus 2, 3 plus 1 plus 1, 2 plus 2 plus 1, 2 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus, one plus. how many ones have I got? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 ways of doing it. So we say the number of partitions of 5 is equal to 7. And we can make a table of these partitions. So if n is equal to 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, or 7, the number of partitions goes 1, 1, um, 2, 3, 5, 7, 11. And now you notice there's this very nice pattern here. The number of partitions of an integer turns out to be just the sequence of primes. You see it's 2, 3, 5, 7. Well, no, actually it isn't because the next number is 15, rather unfortunately. So this is just some sort of freaky coincidence. But it, it does actually make it easy to remember the values of the first few values of the partition function. So what can we do with partitions? Well, Euler studied them and he found this rather nice formula for it. Suppose you... Um, form the partitions into a power series. So this is 1 plus q plus 2q squared plus 3q cubed plus 5q to the 4 and so on. Then he found this can be written as 1 over 1 minus q, 1 minus q squared, 1 minus q cubed and so on. This is reasonably easy to prove if you want an exercise. Um, you notice from this that Euler was really rather good at finding interesting infinite products of things because he found this infinite product for partitions and he found the infinite product for the zeta function. So a typical example of a number theoretic problem about partitions is congruences for partitions. For example, it turns out that p of 5n plus 4 is always divisible by 5. And the partition function has large numbers of rather weird and mysterious congruences. And I'd say that you know, congruences of the partition function are still not fully understood. For instance, we can't really tell you any simple way of telling whether p of n is even or not. Um, so I'll just finish by uh, just suggesting a few books on number theory. Um, I'm just going to suggest some rather old classic books. Um, the first one is the book by Hardy and Wright, An Introduction to the Theory of Numbers. And this is a rather nice book for an introduction because it sort of gives samples of lots and lots of different topics in number theory. So it, it covers a little bit about almost everything and gives a lot of interesting historical background and so on. If you want a textbook with exercises, um, a classic one is the one by Niven and Zuckerman. Actually, this is a rather old edition. There's a newer edition with some additions by Montgomery, which you should probably get if you want to buy it. Um, finally, I want to mention what is possibly the most famous book on number theory of all time, which is Gauss's book on Disquisitiones Arithmeticae. Um, so he originally wrote it in Latin. This means arithmetical researches, but there are now several English translations. Um, there's the original Latin page. You can see he actually wrote his name in, in, in Latin. Um, if you want to get it um, and have a look at it, I would recommend getting the edition published by Springer rather than the edition published by Yale, because unfortunately the edition published by Yale has um, a number of mathematical errors in it, which were, were corrected in the Springer edition.
OK, that's the end of the introduction. The next lecture I will be discussing Euclid's proof that there are an infinite number of primes.